Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Researching African American Ancestors in New England. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer, offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is Megan Siegman, genealogist of the Newbury Street Press here at American Ancestors. Megan holds a PhD in history from Arizona State University, where her focus was public history and American Indian history. Prior to joining American Ancestors, she worked as curator of the Fairbanks House in Dedham, Massachusetts, and as an archivist at the Heard Museum Library in Phoenix. Megan's areas of interest include American Indian history and lineage, African-American research, colonial New England, New York, and German genealogy, immigration to America, westward migration and settlement, and tracing maternal lines. Now, there are hundreds of resources available at the American Ancestors Research Center, our website, AmericanAncestors.org, and through other New England repositories to assist you in researching African American ancestry. Today, Megan will highlight some useful collections, including court and account records, uh, local histories, original manuscripts, and online databases. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is no syllabus for today's session, but there is a fantastic research guide that's been um, newly revised on our website, and that was linked to in your reminder emails, and it will also be included in your follow-up email. We are also recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from this presentation on our website and our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be with you here today um, to talk to you about some resources in New England if you're searching for ancestors of African descent. So first, I just want to talk a bit about racial terminology. Um, racial terminology is constantly in flux. Um, and we have to keep in mind that the historical meaning may be different than our contemporary meaning. So throughout the records, you will see um, the use of terms such as black, Negro, colored, mulatto, all to describe people of African descent. Um, you also will see the term people of color or persons of color. This was used in the historic context as it is today. Um, and this was usually used to describe anyone with uh, that's visibly discernible as non-European descent. And it's important to note that those of European descent in colonial North America did not begin to refer to themselves as white until after around 1680, and that the word black as appeared to those of African lineage did not come into wide use until the 18th century. And then Negro was used more widely over the course of slavery in colonial North America and into the early United States. So you will see these terms used in um, the records that we're going to look at. If you hear me use these terms, these are terms that are coming from the records themselves. Um, when otherwise I will be using the term people of color throughout the presentation. And this is also to encompass the fact that Sometimes in these records, it's hard to discern if we're talking about somebody of African descent or if we're talking about somebody who's um, of indigenous descent as well, so um, or of mixed race. So these are things to keep in mind when you're looking at records. Um, in the origins of African enslavement in New England, um, is something that I want to just point out, just give a little history of the background of that. The first precise date we have of record of is 1638. And these are the first Africans that are brought from the Caribbean that are explicitly trafficked, trafficked to New England um, in trade for captured Pequots. So this is following the Pequot War. Um, prior to this, most slavery in New England um, was enslavement of the indigenous populations in the region. 
And this is the first uh, note that we have a uh, record that people were brought, who were brought from Africa to the Caribbean were then trafficked up to New England. Early enslavement in New England, um, African slaves appealed to New Englanders for two main reasons. Um, so most enslaved in New England until 1700 were members of local indigenous populations. Um, afterwards, after about 1700, there's a great increase in enslavement of Africa, people of African descent. And the reasons for this were Africans were considered legal strangers to the region. So they had no claim to the land um, and having them be strangers, it was easier to write laws to keep them enslaved. Um, and then there were also efforts to convert local indigenous populations to Christianity. So you do see a change over from um, enslavement of the indigenous local indigenous populations over to uh, a more primary enslavement of people from Africa or of African descent um, right around 1700. A uh, list of the leading slave merchants is almost identical to the list of the region's prominent families. So um, people who were enslaved were involved in every aspect of the economy. Um, these prominent families, such as the Fenuels, the Royals, the Cabots, Massachusetts, the Wantons, the Browns, um, Rhode Island, the Whipples of New Hampshire, Eastons of Connecticut, um, all of these families had ties to slavery or were enslaving people um, in their own homes or in their work. Um, you can find enslaved populations being used in farming, timbering, and shipyards, uh, merchant and trading, um, in shops and homes and estates of wealthy families. So it was very much a center part of the economy of New England, um, which is something that we don't often think about. Uh, most often people think about it being explicitly tied to the economy in the South. Uh, but in this time frame in the colonial period, uh, especially um, enslavement of uh, labor um, is, is intrinsically tied to the economy. And it has a great tie to the Caribbean. So I mentioned before that um, the first evidence that we have of Africans being trafficked to New England came through the Caribbean. Um, this is typically the, the route that it would take. Um, and a lot of, you might see instances where you're having um, people who are of mixed race also coming up from the Caribbean, um, whether that be um, Africans, who have had um, children with local indigenous populations. Um, so it can get tricky again in talking about um, the racial uh, language that's being used. Uh, but just to keep in mind that this is all part of this, um, the triangle trade, the slave trade. Um, and this is a good graphic that shows it going right up to Newport um, that you do have uh, enslaved populations from Africa coming into the Caribbean and then moving up um, to New England. So we are directly in a part of that trade. Um, even families that didn't necessarily have enslaved populations in their own households um, may have been making their money um, by having enslaved populations in the Caribbean on plantations they owned there. Um, so these are all things to keep in mind that these are all tied together. And now the reason why I'm giving you a bit of history um, of, of all of this is because I think it's important when you're doing genealogical research and you're looking for ancestors of African descent and you're trying to get back to this early time period, um, you really need to understand the history in order to understand what records may exist for you to be able to find your ancestors. Um, and one way that you're going to do that is to understand New England slave laws and also to understand um, what laws there were that affected free people of color. Um, so in understanding New England slave laws, um, you will then get determine um, if they had any status um, to go to court, if they had any status to um, receive an education or own land or how they might have come by their freedom. Could they only be um, freed if a, if a payment was made by their former enslaver? Um, and these are things that might point you towards other records. 
Um, it's important to note that in 1641, the um, Bodies of Liberty um, that in said that there's a note here that lawful captives taken in just wars could be enslaved. So there's no slavery in Rhode Island. Sorry, we're talking about Rhode Island here. So in Rhode Island, 1641, um, no captive, there was no slavery except for those taken in just war. So captives, meaning indigenous populations, um, and also such strangers, they use the term strangers to um, denote people coming from Africa or other places. So such strangers as willing to sell themselves or are sold to us. Um, so this opens up the possibility for slavery in New England and or in um, Rhode Island in 1641. Um, and in Rhode Island in 1642, this is an, or this act that you see here is 1728, an act relating to the freeing of mulatto and Negro slaves, which says that um, it mandated that slave owners that are manumitting their enslaved people need to pay a sum of not less than a hundred pounds to the town treasury and security in case the freed person is unable to support themselves. So this tells you that if the enslaver has to pay a fee to the town treasurer in order to manumit their enslaved people, there is going there potentially could be a record of that somewhere. Um, so if you're looking to to find out if your ancestor was manumitted in Rhode Island, knowing that this law existed um, could help you point you in the direction of finding such a record. If you want to learn more about um, where you can find out more about the slave laws or laws that were affecting people of color, um, I do recommend a website, uh, slavenorth.com. Um, this gives you a good overview of the history of um, slavery and also um, free people of color in the Northern states. And they do have citations at the bottom where you can then find out where they got that information from, which is always nice to see something cited. Um, so you can go directly to the records yourself if you wanna be able to find out more information. But these uh, pages give you a nice outline of when laws changed, how they shifted. Um, so you can give yourself a nice timeline of what records may exist within the time frame that you're searching for your ancestor. And all of this comes back to determining the legal status of the person that you're looking for. So in Massachusetts, enslaved people were considered both property and as persons before the law, and therefore could institute and prosecute lawsuits against their slave owner. Now, none of these were successful um, prior to uh, 1870 um, <clears throat> when or 1871, once you have the state constitution, um, which sets the precedent for freedom of all persons in the state. Um, but by 1870, there are cases, there are nearly 30 uh, enslaved people that had sued their enslavers for their freedom, um, most of which happened during the years of between 1764 and 1780. Uh, and these are records that you could then find the court case for um, and gain a lot of valuable genealogical information, um, even if they did not win their case. Um, this example is of uh, Elizabeth Freeman or Mum Bet, who was the first enslaved person in Massachusetts to file and win a freedom case um, following the 1870 Massachusetts state constitution. And this decision set the precedent uh, for the Quack Walker trials, which upheld Walker's freedom, uh, and the two cases set the legal, legal precedent for the ending of slavery in Massachusetts, which occurred more or less officially in 1783. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Megan. I just wanted to clarify. I think you were saying 1870 for the state constitution of Massachusetts. It's 1780. Yes, sorry. I'm Sometimes I say things incorrectly. Just, yes, no, nope, just want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> yes, 1780, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you might want to look for or think about is indentures. 
Um, this is an example on the Massachusetts Historical System from the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, sometimes indentures were written up. You can see this one has a date of 1779. So this is just before um, the Massachusetts state constitution and before the Mumbet case. Um, but this is an agreement where um, one party is basically it's it's it, an enslaved person could achieve their freedom by making an agreement like this with the enslaver where they're saying that they will provide service for a certain number of years under a certain set of stipulations whatever those may be and then upon completing that they will be free um so you might be able to find records such as this that aren't quite a manumission um but they do have you know, an ultimate goal of freedom. And then just important to, as, as I had messed up the dates, but um, just uh, to keep in mind some of the dates of emancipation here in New England, um, this might help you to, if you note down in the state where you're looking, um, to give you an idea of if you're looking for ancestors prior to that date or after that date, what their lives may have looked like, um, what laws may have affected them? Um, were your ancestors enslaved prior to the state or were they free people of color? And what would that have looked like for them? Again, all of this is just getting that historic context, which can really help you identify what kind of records may exist for your ancestors. So, you know, just to keep in mind in Vermont, um, 1777 is the date first to abolish slavery, Massachusetts, 1783, uh, Maine with Massachusetts in 1783, but they did, it, were admitted as a free state and when they became their own state in 1820. Um, and then interestingly, you do have these gradual abolition acts, and these are something that you do want to take a look at. Um, in Rhode Island, by 1784, the General Assembly passed the Negro Emancipation Act. And this decreed that all children of slaves born after March 1st, 1784, remained as slaves as children, but then would be free after attaining the age of 21 for boys and 18 for girls. And that all enslaved before 1784 would remain enslaved for the rest of their lives. So just because we have something on the books as a date of 1784, it's a gradual emancipation, and it's something that didn't actually emancipate a chunk of people, because if you were already enslaved by that date, you would remain enslaved for the rest of your life unless the enslaver um, chose to give you your freedom. So in 1790, the federal census shows that there's still over 260 enslaved people in Newport households. Um, so these dates are important to keep in mind, but really think about the whole picture of what that actually means. And then thinking also about, you know, post-emancipation rights. So this can occur whether it's post the state emancipation or whether it's post um, the manumission of your person prior to the end of slavery. Um, and what laws regulated the amount of freedom that was granted to people of color. So looking again, a, a lot of this is like legal work, historical work, um, figuring out what kind of access they had to education, to marriage, to voting, um, to land ownership and occupations. Um, all of these things can give you an idea of what kind of records may exist um, that you could then search for your ancestor. And then also thinking just about travel patterns um, and travel, how people may have traveled from other places. So um, particularly if you have stories of your ancestors coming from the South um, of the Southern United States and moving up North, um, there were kind of general patterns of places and ways people moved. This is an example of like looking at an underground railroad map. So prior to the end of slavery, how people were moving around. Um, this can give you maybe a general idea of where your um, ancestors may have come from prior to moving to New England. And then again, later dates um, past uh, emancipation. Um, we do have the great migrations. There's a couple of great migrations that happen. 
Um, this is a, a map, I believe, of the second one. Um, and this gives you kind of an idea of the general patterns and, and ways people were migrating across the country. Um, again, this isn't, you know, saying that everyone did these exact things, um, but it can give you an idea of the, the places that people were going to and where they were coming from when they were making those migrations. And all of this might give you a better sense of um, where to look for records. And then just turning to some history resources just to give you more of that context. So I already mentioned um, slavenorth.com. The Mass Historical Society has a, a great end of slavery page that you can go to that has a lot of information about um, the history and also types of records and things like that. Um, slavery in Rhode Island, there's this um, wonderful page, usatodaynetwork.com, um, slavery in Rhode Island. They have all kinds of articles that you can click through to get an idea about the history of slavery in Rhode Island. And um, Yale University, their um, Glider Learman Center uh, for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, they have um, great resources to give you more historic context, but also um, point you towards records as well. And then I've just put up a couple of different books that I um, that I found helpful when I've been doing uh, research as well. Um, and, you know, when you're look, going through historic books like this, um, one of the things that I really like to encourage people to do is to read the footnotes, um, figure, out, figure out where they're getting their records and where they're looking, particularly if it's an area when if you're reading something and it's an area of interest to you or your ancestor or they're talking about a particular place, um, go and see where they're finding the records because they might have found something hidden in a repository that could be useful to you. So we've talked a bit about history. Um, I want to talk more about specific resources and how you might find them. Um, so types of resources are pretty similar to what you would do if you're doing any kind of genealogy. Um, so probates and deeds, account books. Um, the court records you might want to look at uh, in different ways. There could be sales, um, manumissions, suits for freedom. All those types of things could be in court records. Um, newspapers, church and cemetery records, military records, manuscripts, um, scholarly projects, and published genealogies. This is just a short list. Um, I'm going to give you some examples going through here of how you might read those resources, um, but it's not, it's definitely not a uh, be all end all of the types of resources that are out there. So in probate records, um, this is an example of an enslaver, um, Joseph Rock in 1683 in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, who is um, willing his, uh, it says here, my Negro Mingo to my wife, um, that he shall serve her and her uh, as good, faithful and obedient servant during the term of 10 years after my decease. Um, and shall then be free. So he's providing freedom to his enslaved man, um, provided that he provide the service to his wife for 10 years. However, I did also think this was an interesting caveat. He, should, he further says that um, if he shall prove otherwise of a good, faithful, obedient servant, then she shall have the liberty to sell him to whomever she shall see to take um, you know, to take a good proceed of him. So even though he's, it's not really a manumission in this uh, D or in this probate record in this will, um, but you are getting a name here. You do have the enslaver um, and you're getting a little bit of a hint of what the culture was like surrounding um, enslaved people in Massachusetts at this time frame that he is giving a term of service saying that he can be free, but you have to follow all these stipulations. And then she could change her mind anyway, if she finds you not to be a good servant. So, um, you know, all things to keep in mind when you're looking at records like this. Uh, again, if you aren't finding any luck in a will, um, turn to the probate inventories. This is the same man, but you can see that the enslavers uh, inventory also lists his enslaved man as well here um, in, in amongst the property of the estate. 
So this is sometimes the only place um, in a probate inventory where you may find somebody who is enslaved being listed by name. Um, sometimes they don't even list them by name in the probate inventory, um, but it might be your only hint that the enslaver um, owned human property um, is by looking at, at the inventory. So it's not always these people are enslaved people are not always mentioned in the will. Sometimes they only show up in the inventory. So you do want to make sure you're looking at both. And it's important to keep in mind that free people of color also made wills. And you might find that as well as you're going through records. Um, this is the will of Anthony Negro. It's likely that he was given that name. Um, to designate his racial status. Um, this is a will from Drake at Massachusetts in 1741, um, which is in Middlesex County, Massachusetts. And he owned, according to this, um, this record, he owned 90 acres of land in Drake at, and 25 pounds in cash, um, as well as some other goods. And it lists all of his children's names in here and how much he gave to each of them, which is a very valuable family record. Um, to date, now I, I, I'm still digging and I'm trying to find out more about these people, uh, but there does not appear to be any further record of this family. However, I have a sneaking suspicion that they did not continue to go by the name Negro. Um, and that they may have uh, taken on or actually used whatever surname they had. Um, and that is why it's been hard to find them in records. Um, so what I'm doing here is then each of these children, I'm searching for records in this area just by their first names alone to try to see if I can find any trace of or hint that would connect back um, to this family. Um, you're also going to want to look for account and other records. So if you don't have any luck finding enslaved ancestors mentioned in an enslaver's uh, probate record, they may be included in account records for the family. Um, if one of my tips here is to check to see if the repository that you're searching for has any guide to their manuscripts. Um, sometimes they've taken the time to go through their records and pull out lists of, of records that relate to um, free people of color or enslaved people, um, and you can then have a better idea of what records you might search for. For example, I just pulled out a family papers collection here where you might not necessarily have thought to look at, you know, a family papers, but there are records in here relating to um, slave, enslaved sales um, and slavery records uh, between, again, New England and the Caribbean, because um, that's, you know, kind of the trade networks here. Um, so there might be something and it might not actually even be related to somebody that the family themselves owned. If they're a merchant family, um, they may have records of enslaved people who were on ships and things like that. So um, always check uh, manuscript collections uh, to see if they have, you know, kind of these hidden sources. And what you're going to look for in account records, the first account kind of account record that you're probably going to be looking for is um, records of enslavers that are purchasing or selling slaves. Um, and this is particularly true if the person is a known um, slave trader or if the individual is known to have enslaved the ancestor that you're searching for. Um, this is an example pulled from, I, I mentioned earlier that Massachusetts Historical Society has an, the end of slavery um, in, in Massachusetts, a collection of, of records here. Um, and this is all about the slave trade and um, the, an account book that they pulled from here that actually lists um, individuals by name. Some account things might be hidden. This is an example from our collection at NHGS. Um, if, if, in this particular instance, you're not looking for an enslaved ancestor, but this is a record of a free person of color being paid for the service that they provided. So it's um, 
that this is to be paid to Pompey, the Negro man, um, for ringing the bell. So sometimes if you're, you know, you're looking in a particular area for a, a town for a particular person, if you look at the account records for the ministers or the doctors or, um, you know, some of the more prominent people that knew a lot of people or would have had dealings with a lot of people in town, you may come across instances like this where you're seeing um, free people of color or um, sometimes even enslaved individuals mentioned by name hidden in a record that wouldn't be listed in the scope note of the collection. So you might not see it just by putting it in a database and doing a search. So a lot of this sometimes requires going page by page um, and just checking to see if, if it mentions um, you know, anybody by name that could be of interest to you. And sometimes you have records that appear completely out of place. Um, at NHGS, we also have this collection, uh, which is uh, papers from Ziba Oaks, who was a slave trader. And these doc, and you wouldn't necessarily think of, he was from Charleston, South Carolina, and you wouldn't think that this would be something that we'd have at a New England archive. Uh, but these documents are part of the Charles Carlton Coffin papers. And Coffin was a reporter for the Boston Journal uh, during the Civil War. And this is a collection of it contains Confederate material that he collected during his career as a war correspondent. So we have records of um, the slave trader in our archive in um, Boston for Charleston, South Carolina. So um, sometimes, you know, thinking outside of the box and, and looking at who the major players are in your region. Um, and, you know, if you know that you're, you're looking for, um, you know, Zeba Oaks was a, a, a big slave trader in South Carolina, then you might pop that into a search somewhere and find out that we have, you know, that in our collection here. So, um, you know, kind of thinking out the box of, of where you might search for material. Uh, as far as court records go, um, in court records, you might find manumissions, you might find petitions or suits for freedom, um, you might find charges for crimes. And then also petitions to purchase or sell property. So this falls under the category of thinking about what free people of color were legally allowed to do, um, what, what rights they had within society. So this is an example from Rhode Island of um, Sarah Ranger, who was a widow of Felix Abbey, who died seven years prior to this petition. And she petitioned the state of Rhode Island for permission to sell the land and house that was left to her by Felix. So she did not have um, the right to sell the land without getting approval from the state first. Um, so understanding the laws surrounding her, her legal status and what she was able to do might point you to look for such a record as this um, to determine that she, she was not able to, to do this on her own. Um, keep in mind that manumissions can be housed in court, probate, um, deeds, and also in manuscript collections. So sometimes they're hidden in manuscript collections. Uh, this is a manumission in our manuscript collection for a man named Cuff in Lincoln, Massachusetts in 1776. Um, and it's available as a digital image in our library catalog online. Um, but you can see that sometimes these things are included in uh, manuscript collections, not just in court probate or deeds. So always try to figure out if, if you know who the enslaver was, um, look for their family papers to see if there is a manuscript collection that might have uh, something like this. Um, you might also, if you're, <clears throat> excuse me, in New England, you might also want to look for warning out books. Um, this is an example of the Boston Overseers of the Poor Records, um, and they do have warning out books from 1745 to 1770, 70, 70, 1771, 1773, and these are records where um, people were warned out of Boston, so basically, um, 
people who were considered undesirable to live in an area. So this usually, as, as it says, it's the overseer of poor records. So um, people who were in poverty that they didn't want in town anymore would get a, an official legal warning to be to remove themselves physically from town. Um, and you might have some people of color listed in here that would be identified as such um, within these records. So it's, it's one of the things that New England um, in the colonial period did. So it's something to, to keep an eye out for. Also looking at newspapers, a couple of things you might find in newspapers, um, slave sale advertisements. Um, these I pulled from that Yale um, collection that I mentioned earlier. Um, and these can often include a description of the enslaved person who is uh, for sale and their skills, um, which can be helpful if you're putting together a family history. You might also find runaway slave ads. Um, this is one from Massachusetts, uh, from the Massachusetts Gazette in 1771. Um, and oftentimes they include a detailed description of the enslaved person, um, including their skills and um, their what they would employ themselves with. Um, this can be, you know, something that is a, a good genealogical resource um, for getting more information about your ancestor if, if they're the one listed in the in the ad, but also to keep in mind that these were put together to try to prevent that person from gaining employment elsewhere and, and make it easier for them to be recognized in order to be returned to enslavement. Um, so it's always um, in, a, a tough thing looking at records like this, knowing that even though you've found a great deal of information about a person, um, the realities of what that record was used for um, are harsh. And this one I pulled um, from freedomonthemove.org and they do have papers um, from New England. So this is an ongoing project as far as my understanding. Um, they are still trying to put more records on here. Um, Freedom on the Move, they're focused exclusively on um, runaway slave ads um, and compiling them into a database where you could easily search for them um, and get images like the one I just showed you. Um, so this is a, a great resource if you're um, looking for that. You can also have great luck in vital and church records. Um, and depending on the record, you might get a great deal of information. Um, you have one here where there's a, kind of a, a whole bunch of information about this whole family. Um, you have Prince who married Patience, um, who was an Indian woman, and it gives you a, a detail about their children and um, all of that. So sometimes you can get a great deal of record or information from a record. Um, sometimes it's more simply um, such as Anthony, an aged Negro man um, who died in uh, 1728. Um, you also might get uh, things where they mention that they are, a, a, are freed um, and then admitted as in baptism. Um, so this can give you an indication. Sometimes it can give you an idea of when they were freed, if you are finding records before and after that date. Um, and then, you know, also looking at entire family units. Um, and here you can see this, these records give you an idea also of who the enslaver was. Um, you can see the name Stevens here, uh, at the, at the very top. And then you do have Zingo, who is a colored servant of John. Um, John is at the very top here, who is the enslaver and it got head has his whole family. Uh, but then you also have down at the bottom here, you've got Pompey of Zingo, um, and it gives you kind of the whole family here. And then also at the bottom, um, <clears throat> you have a colored servant of Dr. Ezra. 
and that he was freed in 1778. So sometimes church records have a great deal of information, particularly if they were members of the church. And just a little note of about comparing records together. I just showed you that church record that had the whole um, Zingo Stevens family. Um, this is a record from the Rhode Island Historical Society. It's an account record. So it's in the account papers um, of Caesar Linden, who was enslaved by Rhode Island Governor uh, Linden, who writes his personal diary of a country picnic. Um, and you'll notice here, so this is these are enslaved people who were going on a picnic together um, and the expenses thereof of going on this picnic. Um, but he also keeps a record here of everyone that attended, which included Zingo Stevens, um, who we saw, and, and Phyllis Linden, who we saw listed on uh, those, the church records. Um, so this points to an entire community. And I always encourage people to do research when you find records like this, research everyone that is included in the record, um, find out as much information as you can about any of them because, um, because each one of these could give you more information about uh, your ancestor as well. And then again, searching for things in different places, you might also want to look for funeral home records. Um, we have uh, a collection in our archive that is not from New England, but is from Pittsburgh, uh, the Gaines Funeral Home Records, but they are housed in our archive um, in Boston. And these can give you a great deal of information about an ancestor um, and their family, their date of death, uh, place of birth, all of this kind of information, funeral home records are a great resource. And then just census records. Sometimes you can have census records that are simply like this Massachusetts, the 1754 slave census that just gives you um, the, the numbers of uh, enslaved people in the town. And that's basically the only information that you get. But you do know that then there is an enslaved population in that, that area. And then when you're looking at um, census records later, um, 1790 forward, you're going to want to pay attention to how they enumerated people of color. So there's usually a different column. Um, sometimes there's multiple different columns. Um, sometimes they separate free people of color from enslaved people. So keep in mind to look at the different columns to, to, to figure out um, if you're looking at the right people. You're going to want to look for military service records. Um, some these types of history books can often be a good starting point um, to getting an idea of people of color that served in the military or over various wars from New England. But then you're going to want to turn if you want to look for specific records that might um, identify your ancestor by name. Um, Fold3 has a great page that's just focused on African American records um, that can give you an idea of how to search and where to search for more information about military service. And I don't want to discredit the anybody from using the Freedom Bureau records just because we're in the North um, and we're talking about New England. The Freedman Bank records did include some northern states, and sometimes, like the example here, you can get information about family members who lived in New England, which can give you a link back to New England. And then I know we're running short on time, but I do want to just show you um, some research projects that I think could help you in your search. Um, the first of which is the Northeast Slavery Records Index. And this started as a project just out of New York. So they do have quite a, a, a large chunk of records um, in New York City, and then they're expanding out to New York State, and then also into New England as a whole. And what's nice about this is you can search just by um, the region where you're looking. So if you're just looking in Rhode Island, you can see what kind of um, records they have pulled. So this is an index that they're not holding any of these records themselves, but they're indexing them and telling you where you might find them. So this gives you an idea of where you can go for more information. 
They also have um, an index of names for enslaved persons. So this is an index that includes all of the first and or first and last names of enslaved people that they have found in records that they've indexed thus far. And you can then click on each of the individual names and find out where those records came from um, and where the information came from. So you can find the exact source. And sometimes they do have a link on their uh, right to the website or to the record itself and where it came from. Um, enslaved.org is a relatively new site um, that's trying to create a database of enslaved people um, that you could then do an easy name search or limit it to New England um, or a particular state in New England to find uh, if they have any records that they've indexed as well. And then Slave Voyages is also a great place to stop if you're looking for um, uh, ship man or ship records. This is also an index. Um, so you're not going to find original records here, but they do, you can limit it by um, where the port of call was. So that in this example, in Newport, and it will give you an idea of how many enslaved people were um, aboard that ship. And then we do have uh, database projects even within our own collection here, the uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, the inhabitants and estates of the town of Boston from 1630 to 1622. Um, and in this particular case, you notice down here on, on the bottom of the record, there's a code and A. If you're searching in this, and this you can get access to right on our website. Um, if you use the code A, it will pull up um, all the 4,000 African American records in, within this database. Um, and they each have this a uh, nice little description as, as much information that, that can be pulled from whatever, from the records that they're looking at. You might also wanna turn to published works that have focused on free people of color in different regions. There are a number of them in New England. And sometimes even if these are not talking about your ancestors directly, they can give you an idea of where you might look for records or give you an idea of um, how you might piece together your own search. And sometimes uh, published genealogies are similar in that respect. Um, you might not find an entire book on your family, uh, maybe you will, but you might also wanna check in journals as well. Uh, that's the example here on the left is a journal article that has um, information about, it's a genealogy of a family. So you don't wanna just look for published books, but also in journals as well. And then just a quick note to not discredit places that could help you as well. Um, the Museum of African American History in Boston, even getting, you know, reaching out to their, um, their staff or looking at their collections can give you an idea of where you might find more records. Um, historic houses, the Royal House um, in Medford, Massachusetts. The, this is a 18th century, um, the Royal family was the largest slave owning family in Massachusetts in the 18th century, and this is their property. Um, the historic house itself is very dedicated to um, researching and providing resources on enslaved uh, people in New England um, and more broadly. So they're a great resource to reach out to. Uh, cemeteries are also wonderful resources, and a lot of these, particularly if they're a predominantly African-American cemetery, many of them have community projects wrapped around them that are actively working to find out more information about them. Um, this is an example of one in Newport, Rhode Island, um, where you can then on the next slide um, see that there is a database that they've put together of the individuals that are buried there. And um, you can get a little bit more information and historic context about the community there as well. And then also just thinking about historic sites and heritage trails in the location where your ancestors lived, um, reaching out to those historic sites and heritage trails, they had to compile their information from somewhere. Um, and they might be able to give you some more information about the history of, of the black community in the region. Um, and give you a better idea of where you might find some more records. 
And again, a local historical societies are also a great place. A lot of these have active projects to identify records within their collections um, specific to free people of co color or enslaved um, ancestors. So reaching out to the local historical societies or libraries in the area where your ancestors lived is always helpful. And the state archives are also working to do this as well. Um, there are many projects in the work across many states to, to do this and to identify um, records in their archive that are specific towards um, people of color. So you might wanna start by looking to see if they have any collection guides, um, but <coughs> excuse me, and think about that as well. So just a quick example of how you might pull all of these things together. Excuse me. So here in, uh, this is Newberry, Massachusetts. And this is uh, an example from the vital records. And you can see at the back of the vital records that they actually separated separate out an entire section for people of color. Um, and here we're focused on Cambridge, who was a servant of uh, Moses Little. And in pulling out the records, uh, the original records themselves, you can see kind of the transformation in this first one, Cambridge is listed as a servant man of Moses Little. And the date on this is 1779, which is prior to emancipation. So this is a marriage record um, for him to a, a servant woman as well um, prior to emancipation. And then this is one from 1784 is a record, another marriage record to another woman um, after emancipation. And it says, it gives you a little bit more detail too about where he's coming from. Now he's given the name Cambridge Little. Um, so he's not just Cambridge, a servant man of Moses Little, but he's um, given the, the surname, he's taken on the surname of his former enslaver, um, and that he's living in the state of New Hampshire. And you can also get a little bit more information about his wife there as well. And then in looking at newspapers, this is just an example of uh, the Newburyport Morning Herald. They did a story in 1902. So this also, you have to keep in mind the historic context of 1902. Um, but it gives you a history, uh, I put that in quotations because it is loose history, more of an oral tradition of Cambridge Little, um, who was formerly enslaved by Moses Little. And this entire story here, while it, can, it has a lot of uh, negative connotation to it as well, it does suggest that there was a vibrant Black community in and around Newburyport, Massachusetts. And it's important to keep in mind in reading this, that even if the stories here are false or elaborated, that it, it shows that these people, that this community did exist and that they were um, a vibrant community and that it leads you towards that there are records that you can find or more records that you can find of this community. And then in looking at the enslaver, Moses Little, um, his probate inventory did, he died after emancipation. So it does not include any information about the people he formerly enslaved, but it does give us an idea that half of his property here at the top was all in Newburyport and the other half was in other lands and other places. So this, I'm just highlighting this because we noted that um, Cambridge Little in his second marriage record was noted of being of New Hampshire. Um, and Moses Little here did own property in New Hampshire. So it's possible that he was living on lands that were owned by his former enslaver. But then in the 1790 record, um, the census, we find Cambridge living in Drake at Massachusetts, which you might remember um, from the earlier record of Anthony Negro, who had a probate in, in Drake. So this piqued my interest. And then in doing some more historic context, um, more historical reading, um, pulling out an academic journal. Sometimes you can find this is New England Quarterly. Um, this was a, an article about the Underground Railroad in Massachusetts. And there's a mention here of, quote, the Negro settlement known as Black North, which was Drake it. And that there, 
this was a path on the Underground Railroad on the way to New Hampshire. So this is two red flags for me. We've got Drake and New Hampshire, two places that we know that Moses Little um, was residing. And which just brought me back again to, um, you know, figuring out more about Anthony. And I know there was a question about whether or not this was his, uh, if Anthony was his last name, it's not. Um, he, <clears throat> um, his son is named Joseph Anthony Negro and that his, his name in the record and as signed at the bottom is Anthony Negro. And his children all in the record are given the name um, Anthony, not as a surname. So it's a little bit complicated. I have searched for the Anthony name um, and other records to see if that was a name, but it is his first name as signed at the bottom of the record. Um, so any, so in any case, um, this just links me back to needing to find more information about Drake it, um, and figuring out exactly who these, these people are, um, that are in this record. If you are interested in getting some more information about different resources or records available, um, we do just have, uh, we just updated our study guide on our website on African-American genealogy, and you can find that on our tools page. All right. Well, thanks, Megan. Um, so before we get to your questions, I did want to tell you about a few upcoming programs. So on Monday, February 28th, legal scholar, social historian, and best-selling author Linda Hirschman will discuss her latest book, The Color of Abolition, How a Printer, a Prophet, and a Contessa Moved a Nation. Also starting next month in March, we'll be holding a four-week online course on getting started in Jewish genealogy. And today we discussed several resources that are available to you on AmericanAncestors.org. And if you'd like to learn more about how best to navigate our website, be sure to join us on March 11th for a Zoom demo with Claire Vale. And to learn more about these programs and all of our upcoming events, uh, be sure to visit AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so let's get to your questions. Um, Megan, we had a few questions about indentures and are those typically held at historical societies? Is that kind of a common record set to find? I wouldn't say it's common. Um, and I would say that it would be more common close the closer you get to the emancipation date in the state where you're looking. Um, where I have seen them has been at historical societies in those manuscript collections. Um, I have not found them in um, probate or deed records. Um, they tend to be more hidden in manuscript collections. So um, historical societies, um, maybe small libraries, other places with archives in the region that would house family papers, um, things like that. I, I don't know of a, um, you know, other than looking at the Northeast Slavery um, Record Index, which is trying to index information like that, um, of a particular database where you would go to search for um, indentures specifically. Um, but they could be treated, you know, like other enslaved papers and documents um, that would be relevant to a database like that. So, um, you know, it might be something that you start seeing pop up as more of these databases start gathering this information. The tricky thing is, is that a lot of historical societies are still trying to figure out what they have. And um, sometimes these things are hidden. And that's where taking note of all of the names that are in any way associated with the people you're looking for um, and looking for records of any of them can sometimes lead you to um, hidden records like that. Um, we have another question. Did some New England states require uh, that you know recently freed people leave the state after they were granted freedom? I have not seen a law that requires that. That would, the only place where I've seen that is in Virginia. Um, where Virginia had very strict laws about free people of color remaining in the state, um, but New England did not have the same. The difference in New England is that it's usually the town that um, you might see, like those warning out records where the town is then deciding that they don't, 
you know, it's kind of those old Puritan um, laws um, where they wanted very specific um, set of people living in town. Um, so you might find something on that. And, and, you know, and that again is it's more to do with poverty than necessarily race. Um, so, you know, you might have some luck in, in that if, if you're looking, but I have not seen um, any states that required um, free people of color to leave the state in New England. Um, another question, what are some best practices or maybe strategies to trace enslaved ancestors uh, with name changes, particularly a woman upon marriage? Yeah, so surnames are some of the hardest things to deal with um, when you're looking at formerly enslaved people. And, you know, it's tricky for a number of reasons because uh, sometimes they are given or take on the name of the former enslaver. Um, sometimes they do that for a while and then they change their name um, or they reclaim a name that they had prior. Um, sometimes you'll find that families pass down a surname for a number of generations, even within slavery, um, and that it came maybe even from, um, you know, not the, the current enslaver, but one that they had two or three, you know, generations prior. Um, so it can be a tricky thing. So what you really want to do, and this is where I really stress gathering as much information as you can about not just your ancestor, but everybody they're associated with, because then if you're finding another record and you're looking at it and you can compare the, you know, the ages, the first names and get a good idea of this is likely to be the same people because they're in the same place, or they're also, you know, witnessing the birth of this person. Um, you know, all of these things piecing together, it's like piecing together a big, uh, puzzle, and determining that it's likely that these are the same people, um, they just changed their name. Um, another question would, or, you know, can DNA um, be helpful in tracing or finding blood relations to a common enslaved ancestor? I mean, I think DNA is like one tool that could potentially be utilized. Um, at least in showing that you have a ancestral connection. Um, I think it would have to be an ancestor that there's good documentation for and as far as who their descendants are to be able to, um, you know, so in that case, you're, you're really using both the paper trail and DNA together, um, which I think, you know, we really should be using for any kind of genealogical work that we're doing. Um, Louisa has an interesting question. She asks, did funeral homes service uh, both enslaved and freed persons, although the cemeteries were segregated? So the funeral, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I know the answer to that question 100%. Um, funeral homes, my understanding, are, are mostly after emancipation. Um, they're kind of a Victorian era thing. Um, which is going to be after the end of slavery across the country. So um, it's possible that they were segregated. The collection that we have in our archive um, is a predominantly black, you know, they serviced um, people of color. So um, you might find uh, funeral homes that are predominantly people of color. Um, and you might find instances where there is you know, segregation. Um, it's a good question. I'd have to look more into it to be able to say for sure, but I would say that it probably varies depending on where you're looking. All right. Well, it looks like those are just about all the questions um, and all the time we have for today. Thank you again, Megan, for a fantastic presentation. Um, a reminder that this this program was recorded you will receive an email from me later tonight 
with a link to the recording as well as a link to that research guide that Megan mentioned. Um, now, if you have more specific questions about your family history, you may consider hiring our research services team or using our chat service. Um, the chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist. It's free, open to the public, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesdays, 9 to 8 p.m. Um, and to access that service, you simply go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. Uh, this free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free for you and for others. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.